Bibles and open to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. We're coming to the end of this chapter here, Hebrews chapter 12, and this morning we're going to look at verses 25 down to verse 29, Hebrews 12. And uh, while you're finding that, in, in, in 1984, an Avianca Airlines jet crashed in Spain. It was a tragic accident. And while they were studying what happened, they found a black box. And as they listened to it, they found out that several minutes before the plane crashed, there was a computer-generated voice that said to the pilots, as they were flying in a mountainous area, they were flying too low, and the computer voice said, pull up, repeatedly, pull up. And they heard the pilots say to the voice, shut up, and they turned the box off. And as a result, there was a terrible crash. Well, it's dangerous to ignore warnings, isn't it? And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 to 29, this is a warning that we're going to get from God. We could call this the final warning. And look at verse number 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? And so this is a solemn warning that the writer of Hebrews is giving to his audience and God inspired him and God is speaking to us today. Now, the reason I call this the final warning is because did you know that throughout the book of Hebrews, it has given several warnings. In fact, there are five warnings in the book of Hebrews and New Testament scholars call these parenthetical warnings. Why parenthetical? Because it's kind of like a parenthesis of thought. The writer is giving his narrative, and in the middle of that, he kind of gives a parenthetical warning like, oh, by the way, don't do this, or let me warn you about this. It's kind of like a, a caution light on a highway. As you drive by, you see the caution light. Five times in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews gives a caution or a warning to the people to whom he is writing. And why is he doing this? All of these warnings have to do with making sure that you're truly saved. Making sure that you had a real salvation commitment to Jesus Christ. Making sure that you truly have repented. Because in that crowd that he was writing to, there were some people who were intellectually convinced about the gospel, but they hadn't made a full commitment to Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you, any crowd that you preach in, there's going to be people like that. There's going to be people that have genuinely repented and had made a commitment to Christ. There are people that perhaps have never really understood the gospel and they're beginning to understand it. And then there are people that they have a, a real understanding of the gospel. They have even, in a sense, been a recipient of the pre-salvation blessings, but they haven't made a full commitment to Christ. That's the crowd that the writer is really addressing these warnings to. It's people that have been associated with the gospel, people that have been associated with the church, people that understand intellectually the gospel. They understand the call of salvation. They understand the way of repentance. They have tasted pre-salvation blessings, but they haven't made a commitment. They're kind of like those people that shop in Sam's on Saturday and they eat all the samples and they don't buy anything. Just go around sampling things, but they never buy. Pretty soon, the person is going to say, you know what? You need to make a decision. I can see some of you are looking at each other about, about that. But these are people that have experienced even blessing by being a part or being associated in the church. And yet the danger for them is, is that they will walk away from all of what God has brought them to. And so the writer gives five warnings. This is going to be a little bit of a longer introduction, but look in chapter 2, verse number 1. Let's look at a few of these warnings, these parenthetical warnings. Look in chapter 2 and verse number 1. Notice what he says here. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. There's one warning. It's a warning about slipping away. God has already revealed Christ to you. He has revealed the gospel to you. You understand what it is? You understand what it is to make a commitment to Christ. You better be careful because you may slip away from that. You're at the point of making that commitment, but it could slip away. You may slip away. That's why he says you better give the more earnest heed. He's using nautical terms here about a ship that's slipping away from the dock. 
You have been a part of the church. You've been a part of the gospel, but you haven't made a commitment. You may slip away if you don't make that full commitment to Christ. Look at the second warning. Look in chapter 3. Look down at verse number 7. Here's another one. This is a warning about hardening your heart. Chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. There's the next warning. Don't harden your heart about what you've heard. You've heard it over and over again and you haven't made a commitment. You can, you know, you can get so accustomed to hearing it and never make a decision that your heart gets hardened and you actually turn away. When we moved to Tennessee years ago, we bought a house, the house that we liked. What I didn't know, I found out later in the middle of the night that there's a train track that runs right behind it. I remember one night with just this train, it felt like it was coming through my living room. It was so very loud. I thought, how am I ever going to be able to sleep in this house? But you know what? Gradually, you know what I found out? I got to the point where I didn't hear that train anymore. I got so used to it that I didn't hear it. And that can happen with anyone who comes and they hear the word of God. They hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit begins to move in their heart. And it happens again and again. And then gradually you get hardened to it without making a decision. And so, again, this is the warning. Don't harden your heart. Don't slip away from the things which you've heard. Don't allow your heart to grow hardened about the gospel. But then look in chapter 6, look in verse number 4. Here's the third warning that he gives, chapter 6. Look in verse number 4. Here's the next warning, and this is a warning about falling away. For it is impossible, chapter 6, verse 4, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, Verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put them to an open shame. Again, these are all pre-salvation blessings that they experienced. A lot of times people read this verse. There are some people that read these verses and say, well, these are people that got saved and lost their salvation. No, that's not what he's referring to. He's not referring to believers here. He's referring to people that have come to the very brink of making a decision to trust Christ and yet haven't made it. And they have experienced all the pre-salvation blessings. They have been renewed to this place of repentance. And all it is left for them to do is to make that commitment to Christ. But rather than making it, they put it off. They've experienced all these things. They have experienced in verse number four, where it says, uh, where it says, you have been enlightened. That is, your eyes were opened to see who Jesus is. You understand the gospel. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. I think this, again, refers to a foretaste of salvation. Just like the 12 spies brought back fruit from the promised land. And people were able to taste of the promised land without even going in. There's a sense in when people can come and they can have a foretaste of salvation without ever making a commitment. He says, you were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You experienced the ministry of the Holy Spirit in some way. Think about it. The people that heard Jesus in his day, they heard him preach and they saw the miracles that he did. And some of them were even healed without making a commitment to Christ. They experienced the ministry of the Holy Spirit through Jesus, but they were never really Christ's follower without being Christ's disciple. A person can come here to church and you can become a partaker. That means you can be associated with the Holy Spirit. You can experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can be convicted. You can be comforted. You can even sing in a service like we're having here today and sing the worship songs and maybe even sense a moving of the Holy Spirit without genuinely being a Christian, without genuinely being saved. And you could taste the good word of God. In Mark 6, 20, it says that Herod heard John the Baptist gladly, but he never truly made a commitment to Christ. You know, you can come and hear the word of God gladly without being a Christian. You can have all of that. You can have a sense of the Holy Spirit. You can taste the good word of God. You can be enlightened. You can have your eyes open to see truth as it is. 
and yet not be a Christian. And so the writer is saying, look, if you come to this point and then you turn away, you fall away, God's not going to renew you again to the place of repentance. He's not going to bring you through all of that again. If you come to the place of understanding all of these things and knowing about Christ, knowing the gospel, and yet you turn away from it, in a sense, what you're saying to God is, I know all about Jesus. I'm just not that impressed with him to make a decision today. And God doesn't appreciate that. God the Father doesn't like that. God says, I'm not going to bring you to this point again. Look at the fourth warning. Look in chapter 10. Look at verse number 26. Again, the same idea. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If you sin willfully. And what does he mean here by sinning willfully? It's disobeying the gospel. After you've received the knowledge. Interesting Greek word here. Gnosis is knowledge. Epi. Gnosis, which is real super knowledge. You don't have just a rudimentary, superficial understanding of the way of salvation and Christ and the things of God. You have a real knowledge of it. You have a good knowledge of it. But if you sin willfully, what's the sin? Turning away from God. This is willfully making a decision to say, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I understand all that. I see all that. I get it. I just, I'm just turning away from it. This is a willful sin. This is not neglect. This is not accidental. This is willful. We have a difference in our law between manslaughter and first-degree murder. Manslaughter is when a, a, a murder or a, a killing might happen accidentally with no intent, an accidental murder. But first-degree murder is when it was intentional. It was planned with foresight. The sin that the writer is talking about here is a first-degree sin, where God has revealed all this truth to you. He's revealed to you about his son, Jesus, and the gospel. And you willfully, intentionally turn away from him. The writer's saying, don't. Are you being there? No wonder they were afraid. No wonder they're in the Old Testament. They said, we don't want to hear anymore. God was shaking. And this was all to show that God is a holy God. And sinful man can't approach holy God. We can now because of the blood of Jesus. But back then they were so afraid. And the whole place shook. And then the writer is saying, you know what? God's going to shake the earth again. If you think that was bad at Mount Sinai, if you think the shaking there was bad, one day in the future, God's going to shake the earth again. And not just the earth, but the heaven also. I mean, the big earthquake hasn't really happened yet. You ever hear people talking about all oh, the big ones coming? Well, yeah, you're right. It is coming. Much more than you think. Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation, when the sixth seal is open, there will be a great earthquake and God will shake the earth and he will shake heaven. He's going to shake loose everything here on this earth. Why is God going to bring this big earthquake? Notice tw verse 27, because he tells us very carefully. And this word yet once more signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. God is going to shake this world until the things that cannot be shaken are the only things that remain. All the things that men scheme for and dream for is going to crumble. All the things, these temporal things of the world is going to crumble. All the things that people live for and die for, these temporal things, it's going to come to nothing. The only things that are going to remain are the things that cannot be shaken. And you know what part of that is? A kingdom, look in verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, cannot be shaken. You know what? The only ones that are going to last through this next earthquake that's coming, the big one, are people that are part of an immovable kingdom. Those people who know Jesus, those people who are trusting in this word that cannot be shaken, that cannot be broken, all those that are a part of this kingdom will not be shaken. Friend, you can take all of my earthly possessions, all the things that I own. That doesn't shake me. I'm part of a kingdom which cannot be moved. My faith, my family, that's the things that we live for, the things that we take to heaven with us. And God says all those things that can be moved will be not brought to nothing. But you that are a Christian, you that are a child of God, 
You are a part of a kingdom which cannot be moved. That's why you should not ignore God's voice when he speaks. So that you can be part of an immovable kingdom. And you can be part of God's people serving. Look in verse 28. We, where, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God. In other words, you better get saved. You better have the grace of God in your heart. And you better then after that serve God with fear and with reverence. That's what he's saying. Make sure you've got this salvation. Make sure that you're saved. Make sure that you know him. And let me give you the third thing. We should never ignore God speaking because of an inescapable punishment, because of an immovable kingdom. But here's the final thing. Because of a immutable God. Look at verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God's a consuming fire. You know what he's saying here? This is the side of God that we don't like to talk about much. God's a God of love and mercy, and thank God that he is. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his love. I love to talk about it. But, friend, there's another part of God, and that's the fact that God is holy. He's a God who judges sin. He's a God of wrath. And he's not going to change for you. He's not going to change for this world. I hear people sometimes say, oh, surely God is not going to send people to hell. Well, he's not changing for you, friend. He's a consuming fire. And if you don't turn from your sin and turn to Christ and obey the gospel, he's not going to make an exception for you. He's a consuming fire. He's a God to be feared. And again, the world doesn't like to talk about this part of God. They don't like to talk about the wrath of God. But the wrath of God, the same Bible that teaches me that God loves me, teaches me that he's a God of wrath. And that's why... The good news is so good because it delivers us from the bad news. And the bad news is he is a holy God. He must judge sin. If you don't repent of your sin, he will judge you. It's not going to change for you. The good news is he will forgive you now. He will show mercy to you now. That's why the blood of Christ cries out to you now. Because he wants to forgive you. He wants to save. But don't test God out. Because he's an immutable God. He is a consuming fire. But friend, he doesn't want to judge you. He wants you to know Christ. He wants you to be saved. I read somewhere that if you're ever in a forest fire, the safest place to stand is on ground that's already been burned. You know the safest place to stand in reference to our salvation is on a place that's already been burned by the judgment of God. And you know what that place is? It's Calvary, where God already judged sin. That's where we stand. We stand at the cross. We stand at Calvary because God's wrath has already fallen upon sin there. It's already judged sin there. It's judged His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why, again, the blood of Christ cries out to you today. And this final warning, the writer is saying, look, don't ignore God's voice. You better make sure. You better make sure that you're saved. Make sure you've made that commitment to Christ. Let's, let's bow for prayer together today. Father, I pray that you'll take these words and press them upon the heart of every listener today. That no one here under the sound of my pleading would walk away would do the very things that the writer has been warning the readers about. To let these things slip. To harden their heart. To fall away from a place of repentance. Away. And then just ignore the voice of God. Not listen. These are dangerous things. May we heed the warning of the writer today. Make sure of our soul salvation. I pray that every person will search their heart today and know that they stand in a place where the wrath of God has already fallen. There's no fear. They stand at the cross. They stand at Christ. They stand in salvation. And Jesus is their Savior. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, friend, I just want you to examine your heart right now before God. In light of these warnings that the writer gives, would you just 
examine your own heart and be thorough with yourself. Make sure. I don't want anyone to die without knowing Christ. There's no hope after that. Take care of business right now. That's why the writer said, today, today, if you will hear his voice. Today, harden not your heart. Would you take care of it today, friend, please? Please? Make sure that you know Christ. Would you just pray right now and just make it firm? Lord, I'm, I trust you and you alone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Make that decision. Make that commitment. And if you made that decision, I, I, we want to pray for you. In a moment, we're going to give an invitation. I'm going to open up this altar. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you and you want someone to pray with you, we're going to be here. But you do what the Holy Spirit tells you. Let's all stand together. Shall we stand together? We're going to sing just as I am. Friend, this altar is open. If we can help you in any way, our ministers will be here in the front. Sing with me just as I am and let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. Do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, friend. Listen to the voice of God. Just as I am.